I had to do it, so did you. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a different spin on this presentation that I've never actually done before, because usually I do this as more of a book talk, um, but that's not really what I wanted to do today. I wanted to do more just a let's look at Buffalo in the 50s kind of thing, um, but that is where this comes from. So I didn't have as many cool things to bring. Usually, you know, I'm all about hands-on history. So I had a little bit and of course I propped up the book to show you that I really did use real things for the book. Here are the saddle shoes right there from the back of the book. And this is hanging on my wall and I was two inches from un, like nailing it and pulling it down and I didn't. So that's still just hanging on the wall at my house. So yeah, that, that banner, actually, I like, this is what the shelf in my office looks like. I have this banner and then these right underneath it. So um, Rob can attest that is literally what it looks like now. Um, so, anyway, welcome to the 50s. Are those original shoes from the 50s? <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> those are, actually they're a little bit older. Those are my mother's shoes from 1949. So, those are authentic. And it's funny, I did a presentation at the 20th Century Club and I had so many women come up to me and, and, and like, go, can I go to what brand those were? Because you had to have a certain brand of shoe. And so that, yeah, they were all about the shoes and the, the dark soles versus the white soles. And I, the, I guess so. Those are always quite a topic of conversation. Um, mine are circa 1980 something. <laughs> so those were my mother's. They do fit me and I do wear them occasionally, um, but they make a better prop than on my feet because I do have my own for my feet. Um, so these are circa cheerleading 1980-something. Um, okay, so where all this stemmed from was me writing this historical fiction novel that was released last year, year and a half, it all becomes a blur. Um, that really just stemmed from having three teenage daughters and coaching cheerleading and you know having been a teenage girl and all of the angst that comes out of being a teenage girl and watching all of them, specifically my cheerleaders, I feel like they were a little more dramatic than my daughters, <laughs> of, of how everything with relationships just seems like life and death. You know, watching them when we would go into practice all the time about the boy that they liked and, you know, all the drama surrounding it. And I just always wanted to grab them and be like, it's going to be fine. You know, like you're going to get your heart broken and you're going to be okay. Like no matter what, you come out on the other side. So it started with a bunch of little shorts that I would kind of write more like therapy after I'd get back from, you know, coaching a cheer practice or, you know, something one of my daughters was going through. Um, so I never intended to do this. If I ever sat down and thought I'm going to write historical fiction, that never would have happened. Um, it just kind of happened along the way where I had all these little blurbs that somehow turned into a story. So that's, um, that's really my hook is that everything in there, it's fictionalized and sensationalized, but everything stems from something real because it's hard to be a teenage girl. And, you know, I've had guys read it saying it's not like, they keep saying, um, guys too. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not my intended audience, but yes, I guess you're correct, guys too. <laughs> so, um, so that's really where this came from, and we'll get into how it ended up being set in 1957 in a minute. But that is how this, you know, boring history girl who just spits back things that already happened kind of jumped into let's take things that already happened and uh, all these feelings all these teenagers have and turn it into a story. So, all right, you guys all know me by now, so we don't have to go through the who am I. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not rookies with that one. Yeah, I'm sure you got filled in. So, <laughs> and I already told you why this book. Um, we're going to talk about why Buffalo in 57. When I was first working on this book, honestly, I was kind of writing it in the present, you know, I was kind of doing it present day with present day songs because that's what, you know, my kids and these girls were living through. And then I had a very smart publisher who was like, you're being an idiot. <laughs> your strength is history. Why are you setting this now? You know, that's where your audience is. That's what you like. What are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> So in the first iteration, I had it set in this fictional town in the 50s, and then, you know, another very wise editor said, 
what are you doing? <laughs> Why isn't this in Western New York somewhere? <laughs> like, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so third iteration, I finally got it right and, uh, and picked 1957 because it actually fit seamlessly with the story I was already telling. And there were so many things going on in Buffalo in 1957 that I had no clue about. I mean, obviously before I was born, you know, but even my parents, you know, at the time I started this, my mom was still alive and I was asking her some of these things and she's like, I had a bunch of toddlers in 57, I don't remember nothing. <laughs> so, uh, so it was really interesting. My brother was actually born in 57 and she, he was the third, so I'm sure she had no idea what she was doing. Um, but Buffalo in 1957 had what was called the 125th anniversary and World Port Celebration. A lot of words. <laughs> what this was, was um, not only the 125th anniversary of the city of Buffalo, it was also the kickoff celebration for Buffalo becoming a world port on the Erie Canal. And this was huge news. This was like worldwide business going on here. Like the Erie Canal, we all know, is what made Buffalo what it was. You know, I mean, from the time they started digging on the Erie Canal to, you know, the end of the 1800s, the population of Buffalo increased 145% just in those six years because of everybody coming to Buffalo to work digging the canal or work on everything that was going to come out because of it. I mean, it's why my family, the Snyders, it's why they ended up coming here. Um, they came here in 1823, which was when digging started on the canal. So, you know, those, those aren't coincidences. So it takes, you know, that really important part of our history and brings it to its next phase of development because the St. Lawrence Seaway was opening, um, it opened in 1959 and Buffalo was gonna be a major player in that. So we were becoming a world port for the very first time. So it, the timing was kind of perfect for them where they're like, we're gonna throw it all together and we're gonna celebrate our anniversary and we're gonna celebrate the world port even though it doesn't officially open for like 18 more months. You know, but they're gonna do the hoopla. So what we have up here are some toys I actually brought with me. Um, we have some wooden nickels from the 125th anniversary. And I like this one, good for five cents cash in Buffalo, New York through noon, only noon, <laughs> September 26, 1957, redeemable in any Buffalo bank. So, um, so yeah, these are actually in here. That's, that's this one right here. So feel free to come play with my toys afterwards because I do have three different wooden nickels and they all have, you know, different, conditions on the back of where they're valid um, and different pictures on the front. So the Buffalo nickel, it, wooden nickel is like really a thing. Um, and they use these as currency back during the World Port celebration. So, so those are actually here in person. Um, and I put on the logo for EC200, the Erie County Bicentennial, because I was actually working on the Bicentennial Commission when I was working on this book. And in my first iteration of it, it was kind of like how the, you know, the 200th anniversary of Erie County kind of played into some of the other stuff I was doing. And then when I had to switch iterations, it became, okay, the story is actually told from someone in present day who's looking back on being a teenager in 1957 during Titanic. -y. Um, and it's all about how this, you know, Erie County Bicentennial is making her think about the World Port celebration in 57. So it kind of takes something happening in present day and reminds her of these escapades of her youth. So, um, so that's how we ended up here in Buffalo because it was a huge deal. The New York Times actually called it the biggest event since the Pan American Exposition of 1901. This thing was being advertised worldwide because it was a world port. Um, and these were some of the things that went on during that time span because throughout those, you know, 10 days or whatever it was, they had different events every day and they had different theme days. They had Young Americans Day, they had Farmers Day, they had all of these different theme days. And throughout all of these, they had different events going on. And it's interesting to see 
how some of our tried and true, you know, landmarks and businesses were still at the heart of what they did back then. Art shows at the Old Ray Knox, the Speaker Series at the Statler, railroad equipment exhibit at LaSalle Park, practical history demonstrations at the Maston Street Armacy, our armory, and the ice capades in Memorial Auditorium. Um, so those were all things that went on throughout the course of this celebration because it was a whole buffalo-wide thing, yes? When was the Memorial Auditorium built? I didn't know it was that old. The odd, yeah, the odd was, the odd was here back. I don't know what, that's a great question. Somebody Google that. I don't know why. Long before that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Was that old? Wow. And they were also using Civic Stadium at that point, the rock pile or Memorial Stadium was called Civic Stadium back then, um, which is where we're gonna get to in a minute. Um, but basically, all of Buffalo shut down during the time of this festival because we had millions of people from all over the world coming here, and this time no one got shot. So, you know, it was, it was a pretty big deal. <laughs> and, you know, schools all closed on Young Americans Day so that all of, you know, the kids could go to the different things. Um, so it was, it was a really big thing. Like, once again, the eyes of the world were on Buffalo for the first time since 1901. Um, and we didn't screw it up this time. So, you know, that was, that was a pretty big deal. So it became the perfect backdrop for my book. So, you know, in the book, it takes place during the year. My book goes January to December. It chronicles an entire year of her life through 1957. And of course, all of these things kick off in the fall. So it's kind of like the different things of them preparing for these to happen. And then once we hit fall, you know, we're in the throes of these events. So it's kind of the backdrop for the story. Um, and then, of course, there's Hello World. This was the premier event of this festival, and it was held in Civic Stadium, again, the Rock Pile War Memorial Stadium, had a cast of 3,000 people. <laughs> and it was, I love this, they called it the story of Buffalo from arrows to atoms. And it was a dramatic historical spectacle split into 13 episodes. Everything was very dramatic. And this, as you'll notice, is right here. You guys are welcome to come and look at it later because it's a great program. It starts with a whole bunch of historical photos, um, and then it goes to current photos, which are historical for us now. <laughs> and the ads in it are priceless. If you just look at the ads that people were taking out, and it goes through all the civic leaders of the time, but it has the full program in there for this Hello World event that was held every night. And that Hello World actually becomes part of my story once we get to September. Um, my character is actually at this when something dramatic happens, you know, in her relationship with this, you know, forbidden love story that we're going through. Um, it actually parallels events that are going on with her to each of the 13 episodes that are going on in Civic Stadium at the time, because you know, girls, it's all about you. So um, she's kind of living through each of these things, you know, the burning of Buffalo um, and all of the different episodes of history. So what this did, Hello World, was basically tell the story of Buffalo from the pioneers and Native Americans all the way through the 1950s, which, this is my favorite part, the Atomic Age. It really showed me how truly freaked out our nation was about the Atomic Age. And it's, I, I actually ended up quoting it in the book because I liked it so much. Like Throughout that chapter, she's hearing the narrator announce these different you know scenes from hello world which i took directly out of this program because all the language was in there when they get to the atomic age it's all about you know and here we stand at the birth of the atomic age you know will this reduce us to dust or will we prevail through like it's all so dramatic and serious the way that they were looking at everything you know will we prevail or will be will we be reduced to ash only time will tell like there was genuine fear that the world was going to end because of you know the atomic race so um, i just i found that fascinating just the way 
you know, here's supposed to be this really celebratory thing. We're celebrating, you know, the anniversary of Buffalo and the World Port, and let's go to this festival, and it ends with atomic doom. <laughs> like, it, it made no sense to me. <laughs> Uh, you know, so so you know that that was the last piece that they looked at when they were describing the time that they were living in. It was called the Atomic Age, and it was all about fear. And I just thought that was such an interesting juxtaposition of we're at this festival and are we all terrified? <laughs> and then of course it at the end goes into Hello World. It goes into looking at the world port. And so it's all about, you know, here we stand, arms outstretched, welcoming the world to our ports. And when they get here, we will step forth and say, hello, world. <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, it, it's, it was really quite something to read through it um, because everything was very over dramatic. But it had this cast of 3,000 people that would come through each of these different episodes um, and, you know, portray different things. And it involved all the groups, you know, any different group that you could think of in the community was somehow involved in this spectacle somewhere or another. Um, so that was, that was the pinnacle of this event was Hello World. So I tried to capture as much of that in the story as I could without geeking out too much about it. <laughs> so I don't know, I think I did a pretty good job of playing off what was going on with my character to, you know, her seeing her life through the eyes of, you know, this story. And then of course, it ends with the atomic age because this is when she sees her guy with a different girl. So that's, you know, her world is turning to ash. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> teenage girls. Okay, so besides that going on, I thought we would just take a look of uh, in and about Buffalo in 1957. These were just some really cool images that I had. And I'm always curious out there, you know, who remembers these places, had been to these places. I actually, I mean, not these specific ones. I mean, we've all been to Parkside Candies, right? <laughs> I would hope so. Um, that obviously is still there. The Loblaws and the Woolworths, those particular ones out aren't there. I remember Loblaws and Woolworths when I was a kid, specifically the Woolworths in the Eastern Hills Mall. That's really the only one that I remember. And there was a Loblaws not far from my house. Um, so everybody out there, you went to all those places. <laughs> there was a Loblaws on Jefferson, I think, near the stadium. Um, where, where we used to park our car there when we went to the Bills games. Oh. But then one one time it got stolen. Like got stolen. <laughs> so um, yeah, ended up under the Grand Island Bridge somewhere with no wheels. Um, yeah. Wow. But, but that was um that was in the '60s, okay? So it's my era is the '60s. But um, I remember the Wild Boys. I remember the Wild Boys. Yeah. Wild Boys mm -hmm. yeah, and Park Parkside Candies were within walking distance. Of, like I was born. In 49 and sisters. Oh, okay. when I grew up there. So you were right in the heart of all of that. Hmm. It's funny you mentioned the Grand Island Bridge because that's actually in my book too because that opened in 57. So many things happened in 57. Um, and so, yeah, there's actually a blurb on the Grand Island Bridge opening in there too. <laughs> I'm just I, noticing on your picture too, like you're showing the, um, the Skyway mm -hmm. like in 1957. Like I didn't know it was that old, right? Like, yeah. Because it, it was brand new, that's why they put it on there. Because they had just put in the Skyway and the Grand Island Bridge. It's like all of that. You know, we were all about transportation and you know, and the goods coming in and getting them out in an easy fashion. So you know, all of the roads were coming in to increase traffic into the city because they expected uh, you know our new port to. You know, little did they know that the railways were going to tank us in a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, that was why they were increasing all of the traffic. I never really thought about studying that picture. It one up on me. Um, okay, so I, I liked those three pictures. This one, the Woolworths is actually University Plaza. That's where that one is. Was. Yeah, all three of them were through. Yeah. Through the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> same photographer, same day. <laughs> and then, of course, we have Duff's on Sheridan and the Glen Campbell Chevrolet on Transit. <laughs> that 
bring it back for anybody? <laughs> Dove still looks exactly the same. Yeah, no. Like swap out that car and you know, and it was today. <laughs> so what if that's historically guessing? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Should be. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved like I love the the convertible in the showroom right there. So that's a pretty awesome picture. Um, so yes, yeah, just life out and about in the fifties. And then of course Bennett High School. Because in the book, there are my shoes again, well, my mom's shoes again. Um, my character goes to Bennett High School because in the 50s, Bennett was the place to be. That was where people who lived outside of the Bennett district would pay tuition to go to Bennett because of everything that it offered. Because they had well, on the student side, the students loved it as I was doing my research because they were the first high school to sponsor rock and roll dances. <laughs> they, they, they would actually sponsor them off campus. Like they would rent venues and they would get musicians and they would sponsor rock and roll dances for the students. And they were the first place around here to embrace rock and roll. So the students obviously wanted to go to Bennett for that. Plus they offered um, German and um, Portuguese and all sorts of languages. So the joke was that if students wanted to go to Bennett, all they had to do was go in and say, I want to learn French, I want to learn German, some language that their school didn't have, and Bennett wouldn't turn them away because they weren't going to turn away a kid, you know, that wanted, you know, more of an opportunity. Um, so the, the, there was a joke on all these things to say to get into Bennett, and then the parents just, you know, had to pay to put them in there. You have quite a nice uh, athletic field behind you. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the story. <laughs> so um, the only sad thing I found as I was researching Bennett High School was that Bennett, who sponsored the high school, actually died before it opened. He was here for the groundbreaking. He donated all of the money, did the plans, everything, <clears throat> came back for the groundbreaking, and then died in his 40s before it even opened from something that I don't remember. Um, so he, uh, he never got to see his dream become a reality, uh, but it really was the place to be. So in my story, that's where Josie Johnson, my, my girl who tells the story, that's where she goes and that's where um, her star-crossed love, Jack, also ends up going to school because Jack in the story is um, a rich boy and she's, you know, a girl, she's lost her dad and, you know, they don't have a lot of money. Her mom's a hairdresser and her mom is a hairdresser for the elite country club set, which is where Jack is from. And, um, you know, they can't be together because they know that her mom will get blackballed if, you know, she ticks off, you know, the country club set and then her family loses their income. So she ends up, you know, desperately trying to stay away from this boy and, you know, they try to, they, they, they don't end up together. I tell you that on page one. They don't, they don't end up together because it's not about the ending, it's about the journey. And that was the message I wanted to give these teenage girls. It's like, that you don't always get the ending that you hope for, but you learn a lot along the way and you take it with you and you come out better for it. So I tell everybody on page one, they don't end up together. Because that's the lesson you need to know. <laughs> Off the soapbox, back to Bennett. So, so Jack ends up going to Bennett because he's a local football star and his parents want the best for him. So he's been going to Catholic schools all along because they are very Catholic and she is not, she's Protestant, so they don't like her for that either. And, um, they want him to have the best of everything. And at that time, the best athletic facilities were at all high stadium at Bennett. So they actually become super big hypocrites because they were, you know, Catholic, Catholic, Catholic education, but they won't send him to Canisius because they don't have a premier athletic facility. So they send him to Bennett. Um, so all high stadium, is actually a little bit famous in and of itself. I threw this in here. I like it says Wrigley Field played by All High Stadium <laughs> because it was used in the film The Natural to be Wrigley Field. So that's a scene from the movie where they're um, down under the bleachers of All High Stadium from The Natural. But I thought it was interesting that in uh, 1948, 
It set the high school, the nationwide high school football attendance record of 52,000 people for Bennett High School versus Kensington High School in the championship. So, I, isn't that crazy for high school it football? If you consider we didn't have the Bills back then. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't have the Bills until the 60s. You know, UB didn't have a football team. Like, this was what they had. We, had, we were Texas. We had high school football. <laughs> so, um, so in the book, that's how our main character, Jack, ends up at Bennett High School because um, they wanted the football team. But I thought that game was at War, War, like Civic Stadium or War Memorial Stadium. They started holding them there after this, I guess, I because see. this was so out of control. I don't think they could fit those 52,000 people. Was that all high? Yeah, I, because I looked, I actually got this out of the Bennett archives, yeah. and uh, yeah, that was the last time they had that many people in there. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. so, so anyway, that's a, that's a little bit on Bennett. So we have Bennett High School in the book, and then of course we have Canisius, because spoiler alert, Jack does end up going back to Canisius, because true story, how the Catholic parents, um, ended up pressuring Canisius to get facilities as good as Bennett. They knew that they wanted to compete with Bennett and they were losing boys to Bennett because they had inferior athletic facilities. So um, this literally occurred in 1957, where of course Canisius here we see the George F. Rand Mansion, in case you guys didn't know, that um, wasn't always a school, that was somebody's house before it became the school. Um, so that was the Rand Mansion. Um, and Canisius actually started in the city. So Canisius High School actually started downtown and then had a fire, outgrew their facility, a whole bunch of things. And that's when they ended up buying the Rand Mansion on Delaware Avenue and moved the high school to where it still is. And it still is in there. Although we know now it's much bigger. Because what they ended up doing in 1957 was demolishing the Milburn Mansion at the corner of Delaware and West Ferry. And if any of you remember, who <laughs> were here last time or know your history, that the Milburn Mansion is where President, President McKinley was taken in 1901 after he was shot at the Pan Am Exposition. So this is McKinley's death house right here. This is where we lost a president. Um, and then of course, Teddy Roosevelt was inaugurated across the street, you know, over it there at the Wilcox Mansion. Um, but this right here at the corner of Delaware and West Ferry stood this mansion. No one, yeah? Well, just a fun fact, George Milburn, whose house it was, actually was from the Tavy area. Really? I did not know that. <laughs> That's why I come here. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Uh, do you know why he sold his house then? I think he went to England. Oh. Or New York City. But he was from England originally, but I think he moved his practice to New York City. So. And didn't care that they knocked his house down. I'm sure Canisius paid him well. Yeah. Because Canisius not only bought his house, but they bought property all the way down in West Ferry so that they could have this massive expansion. And they that's when they built another big building, residence hall, classroom building, plus an athletic facility. So that also happened in 1957. Um, that happened really fast. <laughs> um, and, it was, and it was ready to go by fall. So in the book, by fall of 57, Jack's transferring out of Bennett and going back to Canisius because it's a true story. I mean, the parents put enough pressure on where they knew that they had to compete and they had to build better athletic facilities um, thus, we lost a mansion um, and got Canisius High School football. All right, and now we're to Akron Falls. Another interesting point in my book <laughs> where, actually, you know how I say that everything in the book stemmed from some real life thing that I watched somebody go through? I will never forget this. I don't know if you guys remember the Ice Bucket Challenge like 10 years ago, you know, where it was the fill up, they could challenge somebody, fill up the ice bucket, dump it over their head, and then they have to nominate more people and you're all raising money for, I don't even remember what that was anymore. <laughs> um, so in middle school, this was a very big deal. 
<laughs> okay, you have to picture me. I am coaching seventh and eighth grade girls. And this ice bucket challenge was like the biggest thing that had ever happened to them because it's all who is the guy I like going to nominate for the ice bucket challenge because you all have to pick, you know, three people after you get dunked on, you know, then you have to nominate the next three people who have to do it and pick three more people. So the angst that occurred as we waited to find out who so-and-so was going to nominate, you know, because like back then, like they, they were doing like, if they do like a girl, they do a guy, they do three. So the guys would like do two of their buddies, you know, the girl, you know, the girls would do the same thing, two girls and a guy, like that was very systematic. And, and so just like the, just the, the angst that took place as they waited to see who was going to nominate who, you know, and I'm there the day that the tears are flowing because, you know, so-and-so nominated somebody else. And like, they're there, it's like, oh, this video's up. And it's like, they're just, oh, I can't press the button. I'm too nervous, you know, like it was, it was such a thing. <laughs> so out of that, for the book, because that just made such an impression on me, um, out of the book grew this. And in the book, it turns into something much bigger, as these things do. In the book, it is the death fall challenge. And it is jumping off the falls at Akron Falls, because our idiot daughter has done that several times. <laughs> so I have video. <laughs> um, not on a dare. She just does it for fun. It but in the book, it, it was Lacey. <laughs> So in the book, it turns into basically the same thing. Every spring, you know, the teenagers get up there, they jump off the falls, and then they challenge, as they're falling, they yell out the name of who they're challenging next. And, uh, you know, so all the girls are, you know, like everybody's waiting to see. So anyway, was the Earth's Bucket Challenge turns into that. Was it middle school, after school? They, what? Was it after school where the, you had middle school? No, I was in Amherst. <laughs> I went to Amherst for high school. Oh, well, and I you, wouldn't did, do that. So anyway, so the reason that in the book I ended up talking about Akron Falls back then is because of the ice bucket challenge, and so you know I turned a ice bucket of water to jumping off the waterfall um, and accomplishing the same amount of angst because you know she's waiting to see if Jeff calls her name as he jumps off the waterfall. Um, but the reason it tied in perfectly to my story of these star-crossed lovers is because of the legend of Murder Creek. So do any of you guys know the legend? Yeah. I remember, but I didn't. <laughs> so the it's reason it's called Murder Creek, interesting, if you actually like are down here and take a picture down there, you know how you know your phone always gives you the location, your phone will actually say Murder Creek, <laughs> which I thought was really cool. Um, so the legend is that way, way back when, there was a Native Indian girl and a white officer who became obsessed with her in the land in and around Akron Falls. And he proposed marriage and she declined because she was in love and betrothed to someone else in her tribe. So. He, he proposes, she says no, and he warns her that if she doesn't marry him, he's going to kill all of her family and her. Romantic. So <laughs> she declines, and when she's away from the village one day, he actually goes in and murders her family. She comes back, finds her family murdered. She takes off and hides in a cave in the falls. And a pioneer family finds her um, and starts like helping her and giving her food and you know trying a white pioneer family starts trying to help take care of her as she's hiding in this cave. Meanwhile, her fiance Gray Wolf comes looking for her because she's run away from the village. So he comes to try to find her, rescue her, you know whatever comes next. Unfortunately, Gray Wolf tracks her down here the same time that the white officer tracks her down here. So Grey Wolf goes to defend, you know, the love of his life. The two of them engage in a bloody battle. The, op the officer ends up dying at the hands of Grey Wolf. And then not long after, Grey Wolf also dies from injuries sustained from fighting the officer. And she's left all alone in Murder Creek. <laughs> so it kind of 
plays into my story of, you know, two star-crossed lovers that can't be together because someone else is getting in the way. Just a little bloodier. Um, so anyway, if you're ever at Akron Falls and you take a picture and it says Murder Creek, you know why. <laughs> okay, and then we also talk about Forest Lawn Cemetery, which I know we talked about in depth the last time I was here. But in the book, uh, the school teacher and me could not resist. The school teacher and me has my characters going on a school field trip to Forest Lawn Cemetery and tracking down on a scavenger hunt finding the graves of all of the famous people that they've learned about in history class. And I actually do this tour, Marsha was there, <laughs> I actually do this tour at Forest Lawn where we walk through the path of the story and find the different people from the book. Um, so we have right here, we have Dorothy Berlin Getz, wife of Irving Berlin, if you didn't know that she's in the Forest Lawn Cemetery. Um, she caught typhoid on their honeymoon and died after they got back to Buffalo. And he hired a Buffalo forest to leave a single white rose on her grave every other day um, for years until he finally remarried and his new wife wasn't about it. <laughs> um, and then of course we have William Fargo right here, Wells Fargo wagon. Um, you know, Wells Fargo everything <laughs> actually started in Buffalo and took advantage of the Erie Canal and the rail traffic and everything else. The Fargo Mansion was on the west side of Buffalo. We work at Deuville, did I write down by Deuville? We can actually see um, down Fargo Avenue where the Fargo Mansion used to be. The interesting thing about the Fargo Mansion is that it used wood, we talked about this last time, from every state in the Union. So in the house it had wood from every single state in there, which I still find fascinating and horrifying that they tore it down. <clears throat> So William Fargo's in there. Then of course, President Millard Fillmore um, has his cute little monument in there. Mary Louise Talbert, anybody know about Mary Louise Talbert? She um, was an activist. She actually founded the Niagara Movement that grew into the NAACP. So um, we talk about her in the book. And then up on the top is Louise Blanchard Bethune, who I know we've talked about before if we were here, the first woman architect. Um, she came out of Buffalo, designed the Hotel Lafayette, and a whole bunch of schools and a lot of other things. And the thing that kills me the most about her grave in Forest Lawn is that she doesn't have one. She's buried on, like, with her husband somewhere. This architect who built these amazing things all around Buffalo doesn't even have a decent stone in the cemetery. She's got a historical marker. Because <laughs> they just buried her on the plot of a relative. <laughs> I'm like, that is so wrong and ironic. And then, of course, in the middle, we have Red Jacket, the Seneca Indian chief, um, who was commended, won the Medal of something from George Washington. It's been a long day here. <laughs> um, so we talk about a little scavenger hunt through Forest Lawn in the book. So it's always, you know me, I'm always gonna talk about Forest Lawn. And of course, the Bloker Memorial that we talked about last time. So we're not gonna tell the story again. Um, if you don't know it, you're gonna have to read the book and look it up. But this does play perfectly. If you remember the story about the star-crossed lovers and you know how he ends up dying, uh, because the parents keep them apart, literally my story. <laughs> so she ends up at the Bloker Memorial with Jack and then kind of have that realization of, oh, oh this is us. <laughs> so it, it plays very well um, into the book. And I just love it there, so you know I had to talk about it. All right, so then let's talk about pop culture of the 50s. This is my favorite part, besides the cemetery. I wore the dice earrings, by the way. <laughs> you should have worn yours. I gave Marsha dice earrings. Okay, so Elvis. Do you know that Elvis was in Buffalo in 1957? I'm telling you, perfect storm of events for why my head book had to be in 1957. April 1st, 1957, Elvis plays Memorial Auditorium. And it becomes a really big part of the book. This song becomes like kind of a soundtrack for Josie and Jack as they go through. I mean, it follows it from January through December. And they're at this Elvis concert together, so we get a lot of, you know, living as if you were actually there at the Elvis concert. 
but this was what I was dying to talk about because I've never actually done this part before. <laughs> I did a lot of research on um, news articles from that day and just reactions of the reporters and the crowds and what we look at Elvis now from you know our perspective of looking back at Elvis. I was so interested in the perspective of Elvis at the time, you know, because they thought he was a bit of a freak. And, um, and I found this really interesting. So this was a Buffalo News article. I just love the title. Elvis sings, swings, leaves thousands of teens horse. <laughs> like, great title. Um, so anyway, if you look through that, I mean, you see the typical words when you think of Elvis, you know, gyrating. Um, <laughs> but, and, and ear splitting screams and a fervor of arm waving. <laughs> So, um, this is how the news article began as this reporter was talking about the Elvis concert. And I was reading about how, how early they opened the doors, you know, for this concert and how loud the screaming was outside of the awe just as everybody was coming in. And then they had to sit through all the opening acts. And this reporter was really impressed at how polite everyone was as they sat through the tap dancers and the, you know, it wasn't even other bands. Like it was like vaudeville stuff that was opening up for him. And they talked about how polite the crowd was as they waited. They said a couple of times there were like Elvis chants, but you know, basically they were very polite in waiting for Elvis to get there. Um, and then actual picture from Buffalo. By the That's way. a great picture. I know. <laughs> um, and uh, here we go. He wore a $2,500 gold lame jacket, dark trousers, and $100 gold shoes. So <laughs> that was also in the news article. So I think these pictures, you know, give us, give us a good look at his outfit. The thing that kills me about this one is that nobody really looks that excited behind him. Like they're talking about like the screaming and the waving arms and I'm looking at this and these people are sitting there. <laughs> like, I don't know if it was like the parents that sat in the back, they're like, kids can go in front. Like, I don't know. But like, that was not the frenzy that I was expecting <laughs> as I read about it and thought about it. Maybe um, they were already horse by then. Maybe. <laughs> 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 And then of course, you know, we have this one. So you do have the people, you know, at the stage, you know, trying to get up there. So that looked a little like more practical to me, but this one, as I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> so before he was in the army? Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so his final song, if there's ever a trivia contest, was You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. He moved violently about the stage. <laughs> clasped the hand of an excited Montez Belquist, who we can actually see right there, um, who was 15 of Jamestown, threw himself to his knees in an impassioned gesture, ended the song and dashed from the stage. He ran full stride down the ramp into a waiting auto and was gone. Elvis has <laughs> left the building. <laughs> so, um, so after that, the reporter hung around and started watching as people didn't understand that Elvis was actually gone. So there were people going, like trying to find dressing rooms. And it's like there were people frantically searching for Elvis, not realizing that he was actually already left the building. Um, and so this reporter is interviewing all of these people after the show on their impressions. And that was my favorite part. Because you have the typical teenager that's talking about, you know, best day of my life, and, you know, and, and you know about how he's so dreamy and everything else, and then and then you have, you know, a, like an older couple that was like, we just had to see what it was all about. <laughs> we, we didn't want to come and see what this was. <laughs> and then um, this girl that absolutely cracked me up said, you know, so and so, like it gives her name and where she's from. I think she was like from Tonawanda or something. It's like, was not as impressed. <laughs> and then her quote, I just wanted to comb his hair. <laughs> his hair is so messy. My boyfriend only has two inches of hair. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, man, you're missing the point. <laughs> but if you think about it, like, he was so outrageous for the time, you know? I mean, it was very punk rock to them, what he was doing, you know? And she was a nice conservative girl, and, you know, her boyfriend had the brush cut, and, you know, she just, I just wanted to comb his hair. Like, what 15-year-old girl sees Elvis and says, I just wanted to comb his hair? <laughs> it was just too messy. <laughs> So not everyone was as impressed as others, <laughs> but 
Um, in general, that was um, how the Elvis in Buffalo played out, you know, rousing success um, with mixed reviews, depending on who this reporter was talking to afterwards, <laughs> which I suppose you'll get with anything. I was doing one of these presentations one time and, uh, and there was someone there who was of the age to have been a teenager and they're like, I remember that. I wasn't going. I didn't care. I never liked Elvis. <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> um, okay. All right, and then of course, Buddy Holly. Because I, oh, I like your thumbs up there. <laughs> I love Buddy Holly. And there's, there's part of the book where they talk about how, you know, Josie likes Elvis, but she's a Buddy Holly girl. You know, that was me. Like that is literally, parts of this book are me and that is me. Like I was the kid in the 70s and 80s with a Buddy Holly picture on my wall. You know, that was always my go-to. So um, he also plays a role through the book with his songs and, and just Buddy and how Buddy broke barriers. He was the first white performer to play the Apollo Theater. You know, he was, he was changing the times and that's what my characters are trying to do. They're trying to change the times. So he fit in well, you know, to, to the story. And of course, yes. And a really interesting fact was Buddy Holly had the first band that had two guitars in it instead of just one and changed, basically revolutionized music. That's why the Beatles had two guitars. Uh, and the Beatles say right away that Buddy Holly and the Crickets were one of the reasons they became the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, he really influenced everyone. I mean, it would have been amazing to see what would have happened, you know, if it was not the plane crash on the day the music died, what he would have accomplished. Because if you look at what he accomplished in that short period of time, you know, he is so iconic and he was on the scene for this long. So, you know, it's really sad yet inspiring what he was able to do, even though we talk about all the time with recording techniques and, you know, everything that he was doing that revolutionized what was going on. So, I always have to bring up Buddy. And then, of course, there's a little bit of Sinatra in the book because, you know, Sinatra was still around. Obviously, you know, he hit the Bobby Soxer craze in the 40s, but it was still a thing in the 50s. Um, and then, uh, Frank and Lyman and the Teenagers, we do a little bit of Why Do Fools Fall in Love, because that's basically what the story's about. Um, so we mentioned those things in there, and then all the other things that were happening in 1957 that get thrown into the story. Um, Music Man and Wells Fargo Wagon has a perfect buffalo tie to it. Um, the Music Man was on Broadway, that was brand new. West Side Story was also on Broadway at that time, and I just, I wrote a book about star-crossed lovers, Hello West Side Story. <laughs> so, so we do talk some West Side Story, Guys and Dolls, because that's just one of my favorite musicals of all time. Um, and Annie Get Your Gun was a few years old, that was earlier in the 50s, um, but the movie was really strong in 57, so they have a little bit of anything you can do, I can do better going on in the book. So. I throw a lot of pop culture in there because I'm a teacher and at the end of the day I want the girls reading and guys, I want the people reading this book to learn something. You know, so they're following the story but they're also learning about the times and immersing themselves in the times because it's 99% historically accurate. You know, I mean there are a couple of things, you know, that like, you know, oh that didn't actually happen in September, that was October, you know, like I take a couple of liberties but we're like 99% accurate with what's going on in here. Um, so I, I just tried to give them a full picture of the time period. And then of course we talk about mental health because the other theme that runs through the book is that we compare her doomed relationship with Jack to the stages of grief. So they go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance because a doomed relationship, I watched it with my girls and my cheerleaders, goes through all of those five stages of grief. So throughout that year, Josie goes through each of those stages of grief and, and then we come out with the message that you're going to be okay. And I think that's really important, you know, for these teenagers to realize. And um, so Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote On Death and Dying and she's the one, 1969, that came up with the stages of grief. And I also, here's my creative liberty, this is what is not accurate. 
Um, I, right there, teenage me, <laughs> volunteered at Camp Good Days and Special Times. Because like the character in my book, I lost my dad to cancer as a teenager. So as soon as I was old enough, I started volunteering at Camp Good Days and Special Times with the kids with cancer or kids who had lost a parent to cancer. So I put that into my character where she worked at a really similar facility. And that didn't exist in the 50s. It existed by the time, you know, I needed it in the 90s and 80s. Um, so it, it ties in a little that mental health. That's where I'm not historically accurate. I'm a couple decades ahead of myself of putting her in that situation because that was literally me. Um, but it does play well throughout the group and, and the book because she works with this group of kids throughout the story and sees grief through different angles and is able to apply that to you know her doomed relationship. So there's a lot of mental health going on because as I said, I wrote this for those you know those girls that I saw struggling. <clears throat> I think I still look like that, right? I still look like that. <laughs> um, so. What's ironic, I keep telling this whole time about how, you know, I really wrote this as young adult fiction, that was our target audience, and it's really done much better with the uh, senior citizen set, <laughs> because it's written from the perspective of, you know, 86-year-old Josie remembering what this was like in the 50s, and I'm thinking that the young girls are going to connect with 16-year-old Josie, and it's really been the senior citizens that are like, my glory days. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and so it's really been much more popular um, with, and I, I shouldn't even say senior citizens, I mean just really adult women have enjoyed the looking back and the remembering feeling like that and going through all those things, you know, that seemed so important at the time. Um, so anyway, mental health, very big thing for me. And I don't know if this is going to work if I click this because I'm not on the internet here. On my website, if you've ever been on my website, <laughs> um, it actually goes through all of the different books and presentations that I do. And if you click on the presentations for 1957, on the website, all of those things we just talked about, they're all on there with links that'll take you to the news articles or the videos of Elvis and the videos of Buddy and the news stories about different things. And, there are mental health resources on there. So basically everything in there, you can take the virtual tour of Forest Lawn Cemetery. You can find the real life resources for all the things that we just talked about on the website. So you can actually go in and experience them for yourself in real time. And if you're a book club person, it also has a page of talking points um, that are good for book clubs or schools that use it like as an optional reading exercise. There are prompts that schools can use um, for different questions to talk about different things all the way from history to stages of grief. So anyway, um, check me out. I did it. I did We were small, but that was fun. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You were taking notes, man. What's that about? <laughs> no, no, I like it. It's like, it, it helps me remember things. Yeah. Like two there. slides back, like you had that. There was Irving Berlin was in the uh, the, yeah. the Ethel Merman thing. Isn't yeah. That funny? Like, <laughs> I, yeah, I know. I try. <laughs> it's like he was like yeah he yep. it was his music I guess. I saw three of those real time. Oh, my mother used to take us once a month to the theater. That's amazing. That's even a good person. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of times. I'm the seventh of nine kids. And wow. so when you talk about Buddy Holly, I, I can probably tell you, you know, songs word for word from 1951, I was born in 47, because my brother, older brothers and sisters right. played music all the time. And then the other thing is my parents moved from Forest Avenue out to Tonawanda. Well, Tonawanda was very rural. And my brother started a paper route, the oldest brother, and he had three papers. And it grew to 260 some. Wow. And the four brothers ran it. I only had for, I started when I was seven, and I had seven or eight papers. But, and as they got older, got off the paper route, the smaller got it. But it was the, the largest paper route ever. Wow. Before or after that, for the Buffalo Evening News. That's really cool. Yeah. That's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't make much money. <laughs> <laughs>
So what's, what, we were just having this conversation at dinner the other day, because when I was doing this, I looked up, because I can never pick a favorite Buddy Holly song. It's like, I'm like, well, that's my favorite. No, well, that's my favorite. So I actually looked up what like the, they consider the most famous Buddy Holly song, so now I'm curious if you have a favorite. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> was that the one of you guys, too? Oh, I guess that might be a favorite. Yeah. Not yeah, but I remember what we had at home, the, the Buddy Holly story, which was the, yep. which was the uh, vinyl for the time. Mm -hmm. Yep, I have it on vinyl. And I, you know, I watched the Gary Busey movie in the 70s. I survived that, so. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that paper route, did, like, did they have these big blue boxes mm -hmm. where yeah. the one where you mm -hmm. dropped all the papers in? Mm -hmm. I remember those nuggets. <laughs> That's amazing. Like if you didn't get your paper or something, if the paper boy missed you, like you'd go ride your bike over that big box and open it up and see you if you could go do it. They suck blood to that. My mother wouldn't let that. <laughs> you know, I, remember, I remember at one day, one, near the end of the, my career there, yeah. um, it was 45 cents a week. Wow. We just went to the, uh, the Siri paper, they didn't have a Sunday paper. The, the Siri paper went to a more of a Sunday paper for the Courier Express. So they'd raise it. Is that what you were? A courier. <laughs> so they raised it to 45 cents. And, uh, wow. It was the most, you know, that's an easy thing. <laughs> well, if you consider what the Elvis ticket cost, you could get a lot with that 45 cents. <laughs> I got them, whatever. <laughs> Go on the website. That's where all the good stuff is. And and if you want to come play with my toys, this is a really good look through. Um, and of course, my wooden nickels. <laughs> Not as fun, but still cool.